Johnson on April 11th. I think I've got that date right in my head. <laughs> and, yes. um, so she's going to tell us all about the book. And um, I'm supposed to say also, this is a program, a joint program from the press and the South Dakota Historical Society Foundation. And the foundation on their website where you registered, they keep uh, links to all of these programs. So it takes us about a month or two sometimes to, to get them into shape. And then they're available forever <laughs> on their YouTube channel, I guess. Um, so you can always go back and watch or, or, you know, if you are sad that someone, you know, missed this, you can send them our way and give us about a month and that will be ready for them. So I'm going to introduce Tempe and uh, Tempe grew up on a ranch in Kirby, Montana, which no longer exists. She says she can tell you more about that. <laughs> and, it's 52 miles north of Sheridan, Wyoming, in case you're wondering. And um, she went to school in Sheridan and then went to college in California at Scripps and ended up meeting a, a was he from California? Anyway, you stayed there. He's a California native. No <laughs> and a California native, married and stayed there. So kind of a change from Montana to California. And uh, worked for AAA. When she graduated um, as in sales and then moved to State Farm and eventually had her own agency. And when she retired, she started working on this book project about her grandmother, Jessamine Spear Johnson. So Tempe's got a, a presentation and you all are already muted, so I don't have to ask you that. Um, if you want to, if you haven't already, you can put your um, view option on speaker and then you'll only see Tempe and her slides. And um, when she's done, we'll have an opportunity to ask her questions. And so since there aren't a whole lot of us this time, we'll just have everybody unmute if you have a question and then we can get a conversation going. So thanks you so much for joining us and Tippy. My pleasure to turn it over to you. Okay. So um, first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my background and the, and the book, and then we'll go through the slideshow and, and the presentation. Okay, so yes, I grew up in southeastern Montana and in a ran at our ranch home on whose walls hung the resting photographs of my grandmother, Jessamine. And her photos hung alongside the work of famous Western artists. There was a Frederick Remington prints were mounted on the staircase, uh, which I passed every day on my way up and down to my bedroom. And Hans Kleiber's etchings graced the walls of the bedrooms. He was he was the first um, he was the first ranger in the Bighorn Mountains, but he was an amazing artist doing etchings of of the birds and the mountains. Bill Gollings uh, was a cowboy and then became a painter. And a painting of his of a cowboy rope being a wolf hung over my father's chair. And a Charlie Russell illustrated calendar frequently dangled by the phone in the kitchen. So several of these artists were close family friends or acquaintances of Jessamine and her family. All were men whose paintings and etchings sell today for thousands of dollars. Some of them have their own museums and Jessamine's been forgotten. But as a child, I assumed she was famous and the quality and beauty of her work seemed obvious. I never questioned whether the world beyond my family in our corner of the West knew about her and her artistry. As I grew older, of course, I was disabused of that assumption. Women's accomplishments then were less valued than men's in the same field, less recognition and pay for equally impressive output. On a visit home in 1978, I discovered a surprising legacy from Grandmother Jessamine. At her death in January, my father volunteered to safeguard her extensive photography collection. Jessamine's 34 boxes of negatives and prints, included, including several of her old cameras, were stashed in the basement. A few summers later, my Aunt Annabelle, her eldest daughter, handed me what remained of Jessamine's diaries. It was an amazing treasure trove, full of stories. Finally, in my retirement, I had time to scan the numerous photos from the early 1900s through the 1950s, read her diaries, letters, and, um, and, and some of her genealogy. She was way into that too. I put on cotton gloves each day and opened up 
those 34 boxes one by one, turned on my new scanner, copied and sleeved each image and archival material, labeled each photo sleeve with an acid-free pen, and in the afternoons, I would read and outline her diaries and letters and copy pertinent quotes. Slowly, I uncovered the incredible story of my grandmother's life and her struggle to dedicate time to her love of photography. Jessamine's photography embraced her love of ranching, local history, the animals and their environment, her Native American neighbors, all living at the intersection of Montana and Wyoming. Her prodigious collection of photographs not only revealed her artistic talent, but recorded the enormous changes taking place during her lifespan. Her viewpoint is sensitive, accessible, and feminine. Her love of creating images necessitated different priorities from the usual housewife and mother. For Jessamine to find time to work with her photos often required great determination. During her lifetime, she raised seven children, assisted her husband in running three different ranches, and finally from 1930 until retirement in 1943, with the help of her husband and growing children, she actually managed her father's dude ranch in the Bighorn Mountains outside of Sheridan, Wyoming. That dude ranch was called the Spiro Wigwam, and it is still in operation. And, and it's a historic, it's been uh, given one of those historical recognition uh, plaques. So let me take you back in time to see some of the wonderful images that reflect the progress and development of a long forgotten woman photographer of the West. So first you see that wonderful cover of my book, which is a photograph that she took and then she hand painted it with oils. And it's of a, a photo of a, a small rodeo, no less, in Kirby, Montana. And Kirby um, no longer has a post office box. So ranches in the area have to collect their mail from Busby is down, um, which is north, about 15 miles. And of course, mailman or mailwoman delivers it to your little mailbox on the edge of the highway. So um, Bighorn Visions, because so many of the photos reflect that area in the Bighorn Mountains. And before I go further, I want to talk about the brands because I'm going to mention them and people say, what is she talking about? So the Spiro, which is right here, third from the left, is a brand that actually her grandfather um, invented. And it, it, it was first registered in Wyoming in around 1896, 97. But Jessamine's uh, father, Willis Moses Spear, and there was a lot of Willises, so we have to always go with their middle initial or name. Um, actually started with his brother, Doc, um, running cattle on the Cheyenne and the Crow Reservation. The two of them built the first um, fence around the Crow Reservation just at the time that they were starting to uh, lease, lease land um, for the summer and run cattle. And, um, and Willis organized different ranchers to um, join putting these cattle on these big open spaces. So they did that for until about 1915 and through several bad winters because they didn't raise hay, they didn't feed them during the winter, they lost, the losses were large. Um, also about that time in the early 1920s, the uh, Crow and the Cheyenne families were allotted a certain amount of acreage per family. And a lot of them started fencing them and, and or having one-on-one -on -one relationships with, you can lease my pastures for the summer, and they would have meetings um, in pro agency and sign forms instead of going all the way to Washington to work on the whole reservation. So that was one of the changes that occurred while Jessamine and her husband um, were working with their first own ranch. They had two leased ones before that. Um, in Kirby and the X4 brand, which is to the right of the Spiro brand, was their brand for their ranch that they had from 1919 to 1932, 33 when they lost it to the to the uh, to the uh, 
falling of all the stocks and all of that mess that I'm having. So to the far left, TJ, Jessamine invented a bunch of these brands, and that is my dad's brand for Tory Johnson, who's the fifth child. And next to that brand is the J Spear J, which is Jessamine's initials made into a brand, Jessamine Spear Johnson. Okay, so next. Give you an idea of where we're talking about. Here's Sheridan, Wyoming, right across the border. And the Bighorn Canyon, where the Bighorn River comes out of the uh, out of the mountains, and you see the little Bighorn Battlefield is right here, and then there's Hardin, and then there's Billings. So I'll give you an idea of the location of where they were ranching. It was right, right about there. So Jessamine. She was born in 1886 and passed in 1978. She married her husband, Will, June 6, 1906, right after graduating from high school. From October 1917 to November 1932, she and Will uh, ran the X4 Ranch in Kirby, Montana. They had cattle and sheep and um, a small horse herd. And then from 1930 to 43, she managed the Spiro Wigwam Dig Ranch in the Bighorn Mountains. And why was it called the Spiro Wigwam? Well, the very first building was an octagon and the fireplace was in the center and there was a smoke hole out, out the top. So it was really sort of like the form of a teepee all done in logs. And it's still that way today. They've been added on to, and there's a dining room that was added on, and then a big um, uh, living room and uh, area for people to check in, et cetera, that's been added and was added while she was manager. And there she is with one of her horses at the X4. So her mother, Bell Spear, frustrated artist, finally took up photography in 1897. And this is her original glass plate Kodak camera, which is now in the Little Museum in Bighorn, Wyoming. And she taught Jessamine how to assist her and this started Jessamine's love of photography. Now, their very first ranch that they leased was at the Big Red Ranch in New Cross, Wyoming, just east of Sheridan. And the Big Red Ranch now is actually a, like an art colony and people come in the summer and work on books and paintings and what have you um, at, at New Cross. While they were um, leasing the Big Red Ranch, uh, this was how travel was happening. So Surrey or wagon, this is before cars, this is before 1920. I love this photo because the ladies have, have gone out to check on what's going on with the roundup. And they, uh, this is before divided skirts and they have umbrellas to protect them from the sun. Probably somewhere underneath that back seat, they've got lunch. So branding on the open range with a wood fire is what they were doing initially when they had all that big open space on, on the Crow and the Cheyenne. And this is my grandfather here branding and the fire is right here some wood just locally and um, they're branding calf it looks like a quite large one so it, it, it might be later in the fall they spent a lot of time going from one section of the open areas in the in the crow and cheyenne to gather different groups of cattle and then brand and so sometimes calves have gotten quite big you can see in the corner of the photo that she's put her J Spear J. That was one of her ways of identifying her photos. So in 1919, when they purchased the X4 Ranch, there was a little, um, well, not too little, but a, an old fashioned, a very old fashioned uh, ranch home, which eventually the ranch manager lived in until it caught fire. That's another story. They built this house. Um, starting in 1919 through 1920, using sandstone from local quarry and quite a house. The neighborhood was so excited. They wanted to get inside and see it. It's 
three stories. There's a sun porch up here that's that's um, all enclosed. So in the summertime, um, the screens can open up the windows and the screens keep the flies out and you can sleep on this porch where it's cooler. And with um, five kids when they moved in and then two more came, 23, 19, 23, and 25. So a lot of children running around. And here are some of them. This is my dad, Tori, and his sister, Eileen. This is Eileen also here, eating a bone lamb. And they're playing in one of the wash tubs. She, Jessamine, I think, strapped that camera on her body and just moved around doing stuff because she caught candid photos like this. Um, it's amazing. As well as maybe sort of semi-staging a photo of one of the cowboys on, on a horse. But, um, the kids were, um, there's lots of wonderful little photos of the kids. She called this bed wagon sunrise. So it run up time before cars. They were out in wagons. This has the bed wagon. So there's, uh, if they're staying overnight, they've got their bed rolls. They've got, <laughs> and this, this may be one of the wranglers, but he's got his uh, shovel and he's, he's ready for whatever might come up. And if it's a rattlesnake, then he's got a shovel also, which is helpful. Okay. Also, they use these wagons when um, in late in late August, early September, when they were weaning the calves and trailing cattle to the railroad. And this was before trucks. So how do we get the cattle to, to uh, ship? They trailed them over the mountain and down to the Little Bighorn River and to the railroad head. And this is one of her photos going over the uh, Sioux Pass, which was right up the, the creek from, from their ranch. And it's quite a ways actually up and over. It's probably 25 miles that they trailed the cattle. Okay. And yes, her, her husband had learned how to take care of sheep before they met. He was working for uh, his brother-in-law down um, South of Buffalo, Wyoming, and and was learned how to handle sheep. And he liked working with sheep, and always said, "That's just another additional income in case the cattle prices go down." And we've got wool to sell and lambs to sell. This photo is taken at a place called Red Springs in the Bighorn Mountains, and she also hand painted this image. I love this photo because who knew that's how they stacked hay back then. Whew. And she has arrived with lunch with some of the, she did have when she was at the export, they, they did have help. They had, um, they had a cook, they had a ranch manager and his wife that were there and a crew. And so she lined them up and took a photo and the guys had already pulled the cable to bring the, the next load of hay up so that they could then throw it on the hay stack and then and then spread it out evenly so that you see over here that you make it you make this nice rounded shape. So when it rains, it's only the, the water runs off and it's only the very, very top that might actually um, get some mold on it. So early 1920s, they started buying cars, and they're more like touring cars, some of them. And and off they went to the branding. And so some of the cowboys had gone with the horses and rounded up a group or whatever. And by this time, we're talking about the ranches being smaller and there's summer pastures that are fenced and there's winter pastures that are fenced. And so usually they gather before they take them out to the summer pasture. And so um, they wouldn't have to go very far, but in this case, the, the crew that's coming to help brand and come via, via cars with all kinds of supplies, food, whatever they needed. And they began replacing those wagons. And oh yes, my goodness, women were, women were showing up at the roundup. So right here are, um, this is Annabelle and her sister, Phyllis. Oops, gotta go back. And it's the early 1920s. And 
this is another, the other three ladies are from a nearby ranch and they are at the roundup, um, which the cowboys, father always told us under dinner these wild stories and said that the cowboys didn't want women at the roundup and they would have to stop swearing and heaven forbids, what if she fell off a horse or what have you? And, and I always started laughing because they had me on horseback when I was four. I could hardly do anything but hold on to the horn, but it was better than leaving, having to stay home with me and babysit because my older siblings, I was the youngest, wanted to go and gather cattle and wash the bank. So here we are. And what is fun is there's every variety here. This lady's wearing bloomers. This gal's wearing jogger pants. This pair of jogger's looks more form-fitting, as does this one. And this gal, I don't know, she's got chaps on. So I wonder if she already has Levi's. These guys, some of these guys have Levi's on. So here we are. Now, Jessamine's daughters, they were breaking colts. I've got a picture of Eileen with the colt. They were riding astride. I've got a wonderful photo of her, of Annabelle branding, actually wielding the branding iron right here. This is Annabelle in her shafts now. And interestingly enough, in the early 1920s, that's when guests started to arrive, which we all refer to as dudes. That idea came, I found from research that that idea of calling them dudes sort of started in Yellowstone of all places for the people that showed up to check out Yellowstone. Anyway, it became the title of Dude Branches. So, um, oh sorry, sorry about the phone. Um, so, Annabelle's branding, this is my dad. And these two people right here found out later in notes in the diary that that she um, these two uh, it's a husband and wife and they're from Chicago and they're having the time of their life helping with the branding. And over here is a portrait that Jessica took of Annabelle. Now, right near the crash, Jessamine was out hunting for this photo. One of her photography friends from over in the basin, over the opposite side of the Bighorns, had taken this gorgeous photo of a bawling bull. The mountains are behind it, and you just see the top of the neck of the, of the bawling bull. It's a black and white photo. And it's in a museum, of course, <laughs> over, over in, the, in the basin on your way to Cody. Anyway, she... She wrote a note to somebody who asked her about this, this picture and said, I wanted to find, said, how did he do that? The cow bawling, it happens like that. How do you get that quick enough that you get them with their mouth open and, and it's not blurred? Well, I don't know how she did it, but um, this is her black and white photo, which she hand colored and she ended up selling it to the Northern Pacific as a uh, travel poster. And you could, once in a while, find it online. It's still, people are still buying and selling this um, this poster, and everybody who sees it says, "Oh my goodness, it's like just the essence of the West." There's the cattle, and there's the cowboys, and the dust rising, and the hills, and my goodness, this was just a few days before the stock market crash that she took that photo, and she did sell it to the Northern Pacific. And it gave her some money to buy another camera, a new update. The Spiro Wigwam Dude Ranch is in the Bighorn Mountains outside Sheridan. It's about an hour drive up the mountain. It's still, you need a four-wheel drive when you get up very far. Um, it's still right on the edge of the wilderness area. It's gorgeous up there. Um, the Cheyenne called them the Shining Mountains. This photo is from the early 1930s when Jessamine was the manager. This is the original octagon wigwam it's the chimney in the center and sorry and then the dining room was added on and then this is this is what it's like the sphere on the spiro so when you get up in the in the area over here there's a day ride and you get up on this hillside and look back down you're looking at the the spear o brand in the building forms which is really interesting 
put it together that way. The cabins are all log cabins and um, it's it's a really fun place. And they have a, a place out in the backyard here where they do barbecues all the time. And then they take people on rides and pack trips. So happy dudes returning year after year. So this photo, which is in the book, is of the Omaha Women's Walking Club. So her husband, Will, was from a little town outside Omaha, Nebraska, and they used to go visit on a regular basis. And, and when they were a little bit elderly, they found that the best dentist was there in Omaha, not in Sheridan. So when they needed their teeth worked on, they went to Omaha. And she would go whenever they, um, when, once she was the manager, she used to go to Chicago and several other places going east and um, talk and have meetings in, in hotels and stuff and talk to people about coming west as a guest. And so when she got to Omaha one of the times, she went into the nearest travel agency and talked to the man behind the desk who said, oh my goodness, I need to tell you, I need to tell the ladies, there's a walking club here of ladies. And so we made the connection with her. And these ladies came, I think, seven years in a row. And Jessamine dropped everything and took them up into the mountains on, on a, a pack trip. And took lots of pictures of the ladies. This is one of her, uh, what she called her skyliners, where she wanted people up on the, on the skyline. It's, it's fun. What I love over here is this is this is at the X4 and this couple have obviously been to town. Let's see, we have riding pants, we have we've bought a saddle. Oh my, look at the hats. And um, they they are gonna go back home from wherever they came from. <laughs> and, and they're gonna tell everybody about going west and having fun in the summer. So this photo is up on the open space just outside of the Spiro Wigwam on um, your way to what is still called Spear Mountain. And this is a whole field of lupin. Unfortunately, I've never seen a black and white photo that she colored of this. Can you imagine the blues all across here? Fabulous. It's fabulous in black and white. Pack horses. So right behind you, this is Rocky Canyon that they actually ride through on their way over to another, it's another pass, Rocky Pass. Um, this is what the pack horses carry so that tents and supplies and food and bedrolls all come with you when you go on a pack trip. And this young man right here was well known for riding Bronx in the local rodeos. And lakes and streams, the Hayek and Fishin, this is Cliff Lake here. We don't know the name of the dude lady that's here. I love the reflection of the clouds in the water. She just caught these great photos. And this, it's like an art piece. Put a thought to take a photo of the fish after you cleaned them and had them in the bowl. Just in front of that. This is crossing another ridge uh, above. Timberline, this is one of the young um, dude wranglers. It's leading several pack horses and here come big guests on their ponies. And the sky, it's beautiful, blonde. it's a great photo. Up in the mountain, about 8,200 feet in the Bighorn Mountains is this medicine wheel. And FYI, there are stone wheels all the way from Canada down into Mexico, Central America, and South America that were built by um, Native Americans and Native Mexicans, et cetera, et cetera. All of these different types of wheels align to different stars. Most of the time, it has to do with lining up for recognizing exactly when the solstice happens, both spring and fall. And this particular medicine wheel has been dated finally. Um, there's a medicine wheel north in Alberta that actually had, in, in one of these cairns, had some wood that they were able to actually date. And it was 3,500 years old. It's lined up with the same stars as this one in the Bighorn Mountains. And 
I put on here that, that correspond to the major North Polar stars over the Earth's 24,000 processional cycle. And you'll go, what are you talking about? So this wonderful gal, Ivy, who, who's written this book about the medicine wheel, explained to me that we used to have a different North Star than the one we have now, and that over time it changes. And it's called the processional cycle. And Several of the Cairns pairs here correspond to rising points of the stars Cirrus, Adelbaran, and Rigel at the different solstice. And she figured that all out over several years and recorded uh, different, different star points from these different Cairns and then wrote a book about it. It's just, it's just amazing. And then she was in Bozeman working um, as a professor at Bozeman, um, Montana State, and contacted someone there who found my sister who'd been to Bozeman, who then called me and said, you need to talk to this lady. She wants to know if you have a photo of the medicine wheel from, from whatever. There's news out there that Jessamine took a photo. And so three of her photos are in, in this book, and this is one of them. And this wall is no longer there. The Boy Scouts built this wall around it. Um, way early in the 1920s, and then it was dismantled, and there's actually a wire fence around it now. And um, the Crow and the Cheyenne and the Shoshone have ceremonies up there um, on a regular basis still. Botanical. So Jessamine loved flowers. There's a whole box of flowers. And a great gardener, she also took photos of flowers out, you know, the wildflowers and took um, the other amazing thing, a lot of the photos, they have notes on them. This is the date and the common name and the Latin name and where she took the flower picture. It's just astounding. So some student someday is going to get hold of those photos and try to figure out are the photos of the flowers still in the same places. So Mariposa lilies, they grow wild and usually at lower elevations and drier spots uh, like Davis Creek, which is what Custer wrote up Davis Creek and on his way over to the battlefield. Uh, we had a summer pasture on Davis Creek and there was always Mariposa lilies in June, which is gorgeous. And then this photo, when I came up on this photo, I thought she'd been looking at Japanese art. <laughs> it's like twisted snowy pond. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Okay, so I mentioned Custer not being far from where the ranch was, uh, the Custer Battlefield. Um, this photo is from the earlier, actually, than the 50th anniversary, which was 1926 of the, the Battle of Little Bighorn, when they had first started putting together the monument. And I noticed recently that I hadn't noticed this is on the other side of this edge of this ridge. Somebody's driving by in a 1920 type car. Um, okay, in 1926, there was a big celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And she took this photo. These are Sioux warriors from um, North and South Dakota reservations. The one on the left is White Bull. He's a medicine man of the of the Sioux, and then we have Standing Bear and Red Hawk. And I found later that Red Hawk was a, was a uh, artist and well-known among the, his native tribe for uh, doing uh, beautiful hides and, and other drawings uh, based on their experiences. Okay, at, the, at that 50th anniversary celebration, the Cheyenne, the Northern Cheyenne, were, were there and several of these men were, were friends of Jessamine's. This is Laban Little Wolf, who is the nephew of Chief Little Wolf, who brought the Cheyenne back from Oklahoma. Um, there's a book about that and there's a movie about that. But um, he, there's lots of pictures of Laban Little Wolf um, visiting visiting Jessamine and the family. They had leases uh, with his family. And um, we have 
every name of this individual man, which is also unusual, I found in my research. Often when the natives went to visit the great white father in Washington, and if you go to Smithsonian, the National Museum of American Indian, you'll find photographs like that, and they'll be, they'll be white men, and they'll be um, government officials, et cetera, and every one of them, they have the name, and there'll be four or five Native Americans in the photo, and they'll have two names. They won't have all the names. And so to have this photo and have all the names was amazing historical document. Okay, so other fun things. Here's Old Faithful, and she took that photo in the early 1950s. She, on her way, to go see the Tetons because they had just been made a national park. So there's a few photos of Yellowstone and then there's a whole bunch of the Tetons, but I love this one of, of Old Faithful going off. And Devil's Tower or the Bear Lodge to the Cheyenne people. It's, it's another wonderful landscape photo. So early in the 1910s, the, um, the Crow, the Crow Reservation guy who was kind of the head of the reservation, another white man, um, before they, they elected their own um, native representatives, started the idea of oh, let's have a fair. And he was thinking of showing the crops they were growing and the beautiful quilts the women were making, et cetera. And, they sneakily added in a few other things, which of course the government didn't want them dancing and doing all these other things because that was too wild, trying to tame them. But the crows um, were not tameable. <laughs> and the crow fair just took off. And, and then it's also about the time in the early 1920s when lots of people were coming to visit. They were going to Yellowstone, they were going to Glacier and oh my goodness, we can go to Crow Fair and see some dances and some, some a parade and oh my goodness. And so it really took off and it's still a, a big deal every year the first week of August. And she took, now this is the pre-fair. They had encampments on July 4th weekend at Lodgegrass, Montana, which is just south of uh, um, Crow Agency and the, the Custer Battlefield. And this is a, um, a lady who is the daughter of one of the chiefs. And what's interesting, and then these ladies here, what's interesting that's happening that it's, and I talk about it in my book, they, um, this is post-reservation. Pre-reservation, everybody was in elk tooth dresses and deer skin, et cetera. They did not have Spanish silver, actually it's Spanish and Mexican silver. Uh, they had plain bridles that they had made out of rawhide. And all of a sudden here we have post-reservation, they have access to, to items that they never had access to before. And boy, did they love to dress up. So here we go, Pendleton blankets, tapaderos on their saddles, beautiful. Um, handmade saddles. And the other thing I found out from a Crow historian, the lady was telling me, oh, Tempe, look at this. Said, what, what am I looking at? She said, that's a scarf. I said, oh, yeah. She said, well, the ladies found out that they could get these beautiful cotton or silk scarves. And it got to be a big deal. This gal has one too. Um, to, to coordinate with the colors. See, there's some pink and yellow and there's some pink in her, in her blanket there. And she said it was just it's so exciting to have these new new things to add to their to their garments. It's really fun. Okay, so not all of the Native Americans, when they got an allotment, moved and immediately started ranching on their own. A lot of them still do not, and they still lease out the land. Iris um, and Charles Rising Sun. So this is Iris and her son Charles, and I believe her husband was also Charles. They are Northern Cheyenne. They have a ranch just north of the X4 on their way to Busby. And 
and they were friends of the family. There's a whole bunch of pictures of this family visiting with Jessamine, or she went over to on her way maybe to Hardin and, and stop and visit with Iris. And there's lovely pictures of, of the kids. And again, this is this intimacy that you see feminine view, the women, another woman taking a picture of another woman. And um, and it's it's unusual. There's not that many uh, of those kind of portraits. Here's Laban Little Wolf again um, with his beautiful headdress and his scalp lock. I never found that out anyway. He's all dressed up, except he's got blue jeans on. <laughs> but she took that portrait of him when he was visiting uh, the export. Okay, this is Marjorie. Yellowtail Stefan. Her father, um, Mr. Yellowtail, was the first uh, crow actual head of the reservation instead of having a white man do that and uh, friends of, of the Spear and Johnson family. Marjorie is here in her teepee. This is right there at Crow Fair. What's fun about this photo is all the old and new things. There is the, there is the uh, elk tooth, beautiful. Um, dress, but actually, it's just the top part, the, the, almost like the shirt part that's covered in elk teeth. There's a Pendleton blanket. There's new cotton, beautiful um, fabric that's lining the teepee. And there's an old fashioned, what they call the headdress. And look at her, she's got old fashioned, beautiful, doe skin boots, but she has a brand new, modern, very uh, beautiful fabric dress. And there's a bear rug right here, or a buffalo rug, probably. So all sorts of interesting things going on in this, in this one photograph. And it's on the woman's side of the TV, another unusual thing to um, have access like that. This lady, I think it's Susan Iron Teeth and the gal who's the curator over at the big, uh, Donald and Little Bighorn thought it would possibly, because we have other photos and it looks like her in that photo, but Chessman didn't write who this woman was. She's at advanced age. It looks like she's probably lost eyesight in this one eye, but she's wearing very traditional and very beautiful clothing. And it's very, um, and also, she's, this is one of the things that Jessica liked to put in order around her photos, which she had them developed. This is my dad, Tori, um, fifth child, and he too became a rancher throughout his life. Um, he's riding Mickey, one of his favorite horses. And after they lost the X4, there was a bit of a small ranch left where they kept their horses from the Spiro Wigwam in the winter time. And they had enough pasturage that eventually they had some cattle there too. But they built extra cabins and, and brought some of the dudes in in the summer. And therefore they were very close to go to the battlefields and see other local uh, interesting things and rodeos besides going up into the big horns. And 1939, before dad got married, um, on a, a summer afternoon, he and um, Jessamine and Nikki were posing at different points around this little Rosebud Mountain Ranch. And there's, there's like 15 different photos, nine of which were just fabulous. And I um, picked out six, didn't tell my brothers and sisters about this, but I found it. And I framed it up and brought it up to uh, Montana one summer and showed it to everybody. And they were just, where did you find that photograph? And I said, well, those treasures and all those book boxes. There it is. Okay. This is the end of my little talk. And we're riding into the sunrise instead of into the sunset. This is on the way to the roundup. And it's very early morning. The light's not very bright. It's like ghost riders and the dust is rising. And I don't know, it's just fabulous. I love this photo. So that's the end of my talk and I'm ready for any kind of 
Oh, oh Tempe, that was so fun. Those <laughs> photos as a publisher, when we first saw those photos, but this is amazing collection of really rare those moments, those intimate moments, especially you're talking about and um, the, the feminine view through the camera lens. It's yeah. really unusual in the time. Right? <laughs> those yeah. late many, um, 19th, early 20th century photos. So invitation to all of you to unmute and ask questions of Timpy. And you can you can uh, show us your video or not. <laughs> it can be a disembodied voice. We don't mind. All right. So, Timpy, how many photos would you say you have? Because I think um, I have actually about a hundred images in the book for the longest time, and there were photos that I scanned and looked at, and they were in poor shape, and I did not put them into my computer. I did put them in archival sleeve. Uh, if she had written something on the little brown uh, envelope that they were in, which was leaking acid into the negatives, which was very scary. Um, I kept the message, et cetera, um, but they didn't go onto my computer. But what, after, I don't know how long, I, I sat down and tried to figure out how many, but it was over 16,000 wow. that are on my computer. Wow. Now, it's, not all of them are fabulous or in really good shape, but I kept the ones that I thought had some, some sort of historical information to them and whether they were in the best shape possible right. didn't matter. Right, because they're still re recording something yes. that may not be recorded anywhere else. That's right. Um, That's right. I don't yeah. think you included any of these, but they're in the book. Um, that Jessamine's Early photography was on these glass negatives that glass are negatives curved. With their mother, yeah, yeah. And, and those I are only have a few copies of that, but the but the Sheridan County Library and also the little museum out in in, uh, in Bighorn, which is called the Bozeman Trail Museum, uh, have some of uh, actual glass plate photos that were developed. So they have some of them uh, available for viewing. Were they some of Jessamine's? Or just there's only a few that were actually ones that we're pretty sure Jessamine took because I've got I've got them in the collection. Right. So they you can label that them. way. They were early enough it had to be that her and we found um one of her ledger books from 1908. So she was married in 1906. And in that one ledger book is the purchase of her first camera. It's a brownie camera and it cost her two dollars. But she was so interested in what was happening. So in the diaries I have, in the very front, as years go by, she lists the cameras. And then she at one point she bought a movie camera. I mean, she just she just kept buying new cameras. She bought um, a panorama. I think there's a couple of photos there that are panoramas. There's, there's three boxes of panoramas. So um, she just went to town, but I don't think she ever told Will what she was doing because she was, <laughs> she was selling some of those photos to the dudes. And so she pocketed the money and went out and bought a new camera. One of your um, yeah. stories that really caught my attention was how you and your siblings and your cousins have just happened upon in Montana and Wyoming, just walking into a restaurant framed uh, oh. photographs that oh, yeah. are not signed and so that was yeah. part of the mission that's of right. the book is to, to right. give credit to the photographer yes and so the the the, the bighorn county museum in harding uh the gal that was the manager then when i first started had me come in because she didn't realize that they had a bunch of her photos they had a few that were signed and a few that people had donated and said these are jessamines but she pulled out a whole bunch of, and the J Spear J brand was in the corner, or I recognized the photo and made a note and got back to her about what the photo was, what year, et cetera. So, and then I went to the, the um, is it the Rocky Mountain Museum that's in Bozeman? And they have some of her photos, but they were identified. But the, but the, um, Gallatin Valley Museum 
that's in Bozeman. They had several of her photos, including one huge enlargement that was done um, by one of her friends and it was hanging in their cafe. And uh, that, that actually that photo's in the book. It's, it's a, a red chalfant coming into, driving the horses into the corral. It's a bears and colts. And this thing is blown up to cover a wall. And my brother walked in there when he was working in the bank nearby years ago and went, oh my God, that's grandmother's photo. And they didn't know who the photographer was or anything. And, and then when I went, I, they toured me around and we found someone else's photos and we found some of Jessamine's photos that they didn't know. And so uh, it's, it's interesting. Things are popping up. I, I see. Curtis, do you have a question? I see you unmuted. Yeah, I don't, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if you address this or not, but did she develop her photographs or did she send it away or what? Oh. Did she do? Yes, she had a dark room in the X4. Um, okay. Interestingly enough, being a person who obviously hated housework, there's no photos of the kitchen. There's no photos of the laundry room, though she spent a lot of time talking about the laundry every Monday in her diaries. Uh, but there's photos of the beautiful fireplace. There's photos of everything dressed up for Christmas. But anything that had to do with women's work, there's no photos. And, um, and it's just interesting. Um, yes, as I went through the boxes and the boxes were dated. I could see, and then she talks about spending time developing the photos. And as time went by, all of a sudden, little envelopes appeared stuffed in the boxes with the photos. And she was sending the prints to uh, Billings and eventually back into Sheridan. And so being the busy woman that she was, as time went by, more and more of them were being developed uh, in a regular photography um, store. Okay, I see. I went on eBay. I see there's one of her ranch ones, but also she did some photography in the Grand Canyon, apparently. The, no. Oh, maybe it's a different name. Yeah. Or different. It was just. I know that she never made it to the Grand Canyon. I see. Okay, there is one of what it looks like the vintage of your. What you? Yeah, it might be the Bighorn Canyon because the Bighorn Canyon. Coming out of it's coming out of the corner of, of of Wyoming into Montana is an amazing canyon uh, okay. full of colored rocks and um, nowadays you can you have to go over north of Cody and and you can get on a boat ride and go up the canyon but when she and and Will were taking dudes there they went all the way there's photos where they went all the way down into the canyon. Actually, I think there's a photo in the book of, of the Big Horn Canyon, but they, they would take the dudes right down this very steep trail into the canyon and they would camp next to the river bottom. And there's some incredible photos of that canyon. Yeah. So, yeah. And, it, and you could look at that and almost think that that's the Grand Canyon, but it's, it's the big Well, one. these were the, I'm pretty sure it was, but anyway, it could, maybe I didn't look carefully. Um, yeah, you're right. That Big Horn Valley in Canyon is incredible. Yes, the boat and it could be that somebody it. found a photo and bought it and thought it was the Grand Canyon, but it isn't. It's the Big Horn Canyon. Okay, the um, name is on it. Yeah. Well, those two were affordable. The other one was. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you very much. You find online, it's it's amazing. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. This was very impressive. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. So, Timpy, did um, Jessamine's ability to develop them once they lost the the ranch uh -huh. after the great depression or after the big fall um oh after the big fall yeah yeah so, so then she had she lost her dark room um, they yes. build a new one lost eventually and they had Next to build a new cabin over in that little rosebud mountain ranch which it took a couple years before they did that what they did is they moved the family into sheridan because her father had a big house uh now where the Safeway is. <laughs> I know where that is. <laughs> so, there's a big house that, that, that they built there. Um, uh, her father um, built and and he said, oh, come and stay in the house. And they had several kids that were in school at that point. So they moved into Sheridan 
when they lost that ranch. And then by that time, of course, she was spending the summers up at the wigwam running that dude ranch. But so about, um, I think it was about 1936, 37, that they actually built extra cabins and built a cabin for themselves at what they called the Rosebud Mountain Ranch. It's due east of the X4. And it wasn't a lot of acreage, but it's a pretty little place. And um, so they had a, um, so they had that until 40, let's see, 43, they sold the wigwam. And in 45, they sold their little rosebud ranch and they moved to Story, Wyoming for retirement. Did she ever have another dark room? No, not that I'm aware of. Now her sister, Elsa, had a dark room and, and, and a larger. And it was, Elsa lived in Sheridan most of her life. And the two of them, uh, both of them were there at the 50th anniversary of the Custer fight and they were taking photos and um, and Elsa helped her um, enlarge some of her photos, et cetera. So they worked together um, on some of their projects. So Elsa did have a dark room, so. If you don't have your own, it's good to have a sister with one, right? <laughs> That's right. 